Once again, my name is Blaine Butler. I'm a product owner at the Center for Open Science, um, COS. COS is a nonprofit organization with a mission to increase openness, integrity, and reproducibility of research by enabling open scholarship practices, making them easier and more normative. Um, one of the ways in which we do this is by, we develop and maintain the OSF, or Open Science Framework. Um, this is a uh, software platform that allows researchers to um, share all of their research. Oh, share my screen, sorry. Okay. Um, so this is a um, software platform that allows researchers to share their work as they go through um, search and discovery, designing their study, collecting and analyzing data, and then any other research outputs that they have from their research project. Um, so I dropped the link. As I said, this is the hands-on webinar. Um, so you will be able to kind of use the link to the document um, as a reference guide later on. Um, you also have the ability to, uh, you know, do things as we're doing this, but, you know, you don't have to keep up and do everything that I'm doing as I'm going through these things. So I'm going to move on. All right, so now we're gonna have a poll on everyone's familiarity with the OSF. Um, do you have an OSF account? Uh, how familiar are you? Oh, wow. So a lot of you already have an OSF account. Oh, whoops, sorry. Um, but not that familiar or slightly familiar. Good to see that not too many people that are extremely familiar are here because this is a very uh, basic introduction to all of the things on the OSF. Okay. So thank you for responding to that. So here are some of the topics that we're going to be going over. Okay. Um, so we're gonna go over the account and profile how you discover content, so OSF search, research planning, registrations and pre-registrations, study management and collaboration, our OSF projects, which I think of as the, the core of the OSF platform, um, research sharing, which includes OSF preprints, but there's also other ways you can share your research outputs, and then relationships, so how a lot of resources are connected across the OSF. Um, so what is the OSF? We're going to go over now. So the first thing you can do is you can sign in or sign up. So let's say you don't have an account, although most of you do. Um, you can sign up through ORC ID or your ORCID or your institutional login. If you don't know if your institution, only uh, OSFI or OSF institutional members have the ability to sign on through their institution. If you don't know if your institution is a member, you can easily find out without having to sign in and search your institution. So I went to James Madison. If I still had access or was still a student at James Madison, I could sign in through my uh, institutional login. However, I'm not. <laughs> so I'm just going to sign in with my COS password. There is a way that you can put two-factor authentication in here. Um, I have not done that. Or I turned it off for these types of things because it gets um, a little bit harder to demo when you're doing these. Okay, so now that I've signed in, I'm gonna show you a little bit about your profile. Um, ignore the activity points, public projects. Um, I've linked my ORC ID. I also have my LinkedIn. Um, employment and education I have not filled out, but I can always edit those. Um, if I go to my settings. So one of the things that's really nice is um, if you go to your account settings, um, let's say that you move institutions and you need to change the email associated with your account. You can easily do that here. So I could put in my, um, instead of my COS email, I could put in my personal email. Um, no. 
going to do that right now. But you could do that, and that's one way that you make sure that anything within your OSF uh, user account is kept with you if you move institutions, change jobs, um, or just need a different email address that you want to use for um, handling your content. Okay, so now let's go to search. So this is how you can discover things on the OSF. Um, we revamped this just last year. So one of the nice things we have is all of these filters. I can zoom in a little bit. Um, so let's say that you're interested in projects and you're interested in projects maybe that are funded by Welcome Trust. So now you know there's 30 projects funded by Welcome Trust. You can then grab this URL and let's say you have a different, you can send that to somebody and they can easily post it in their uh, browser and they will get the exact same results. So that's a really nice feature. You can also use, um, you can use license type, um, any type of the institution. So of the ones that are funded by Welcome Trust, University of Manchester is one of the institutional members that has funding or has a project funded by Welcome Trust. Um, and then all of these are, you know, like I said, you can copy the URL and send that to somebody as a way that they can also see the same results that you're seeing. So now let's go into research planning. So research planning, which is where you're developing your idea, designing your study, and then acquiring materials. So within that, I'm going to go to OSF registries. Um, we have a lot, or not a lot, we have um, specific uh, registry members. These, a lot of these registries are uh, moderated. However, if you wanna just register or pre-register your study, you can simply do that through OSF registries. Um, so let's say you wanna create a new registration. Um, if you need any help with templates, that should be in the Google Doc. We also have a great um, support center. I will show you that at the end of this webinar. Um, let's say that I don't have any content in an existing OSF project. And just for demo purposes, I'm gonna use the open-ended registration. It's just one of the simplest ones um, to use and is applicable for almost any type of registration when you're just trying to um, document you know, what your idea is and how you're going to study that. So kind of like how you would plan out the research project you're getting ready to do. So then I'm just gonna create a draft. So, and then you'll need, oh. Um, you have contributors, this is other, um, any institutions that you are affiliated with will be here and you can affiliate them or not. Also a license. And then just life sciences. Um, it's also really good to add tags if you're doing this with like maybe uh, cell cycle. So let's say if you're doing a, a research study on cancer or cell cycle um, blockers. So those types of tags can make your work more discoverable, um, easier to find with OSF search with terms. Um, you would then go on, you can provide a summary. And if you don't have um, a project you're working with, but you have maybe some additional files you want to add, you can upload a file here. And I'll just pick my 
my simple. But any files, you can upload image files, you can upload other types of files here as well. So then I would review this. I can see the metadata associated. You can also add additional contributors if you go back to the metadata, the blockers, and then the file. Um, I am not going to register this. You would just, if you wanted to register your registration, you simply click register um, and you'll get an approval notification going to um, any of the contributors that are considered admin contributors. Um, I'm just going to delete this draft. One of the other nice things about registries or registrations is that you can update them. So let's say you've started on your project and or you started on your um, project plan and something changes. You simply go in and update it. And this is what an update would look like. So this was a test project registration on one of our test servers. Um, I updated it. I just basically said changing our test parameters based on some initial results. Um, and then you have to add more information in either your summary or your description in order to change that. And going back here, I can see I do have test registrations on the OSF. To update it, you would simply hit update. Okay. So um, talking about registrations and pre-registrations, the typical trajectory is design, conduct, report, and publish. Um, you can put in your registration around design, um, and it's a really nice way of helping to lay out what you're going to do before you actually start conducting it to kind of get your plan in place. Um, why is it important to register or pre-register? Well, a pre-registration is a time-stamped version of your research plan commit, created and submitted to a public registry before the study is con uh, conducted. Um, these are a formal, transparent story. As I said, you can update, which makes any changes you make to your research plan as you're you know, going along very transparent to the public um, or any of your other peers or collaborators. Um, you know, like I said, it's a study management plan kind of along the lines of a data management plan. Um, Pre-registrations versus registrations. Uh, registration, Pre-registrations should be conducted or should be created before any type of data collection or analysis has begun. That is the significant difference between registrations and pre-registrations. Um, you can create a registration at any point in time during your study. You can only create a pre-registration if you have yet to begin or start analyzing any data collection. Here's some more information on pre-registration pre -registration versus registration. Um, we will send these slides out with the recording after this. So uh, don't worry about trying to keep up with all of the information I'm showing here. If you have any questions, like I said, I have some stuff about our support at the very end. But if you have questions about registrations, please email in support at osf.io. We are more than willing to help with, help you or meet with you to answer questions that are specific to your type of registration, pre-registration, or anything you're doing on the OSF. We will also be sending out links. We've just started um, OSF office hours. These are 15-minute uh, meetings with uh, uh, other COS staff, include, me included, that allow you to have, if you have specific questions you need help with, to allow you to book time with us in order to get your questions answered and help you in your um, your journal or your journey on the OSF. Okay, so now we're going on to uh, OSF projects, which is my favorite part of the OSF. Um, it's the study management and collaboration part of the OSF. So let's go here. Go on. So I'm actually going to go to, um, once again, our test server so that I don't actually do anything um, on the actual OSF. So I'm going to create a new project. Um, and then I'm going to, there's a, I'm going to affiliate the COS for storage locations. 
So uh, we have various data storage. So I always pick the US, but we also have um, Canada, Germany, the US, and uh, there was also Australia up here. Um, so you can pick a storage location for your data that is um, for wherever you, you are located. So most people in the European Union use Germany so that um, any data storage requirements that are needed for European Union's funded studies are met by um, having your data stored in the Germany Frankfurt location. There's also one for Canada. And like I said, there was in Australia. I always pick the US. Um, okay. So I'm gonna create my project. I'm going to go to this project. So I have test project one. So um, one of the nice things is, is that you can um, make your project public. And once you make your project public, you could now create a DOI for your project. And that would be a DOI that would link to anything you have stored in your project, such as data, um, any documents, um, code, questionnaires, anything that you want to share, there is now a DOI associated with this project. I'm not going to create one because um, I don't need a DOI for a test project. Um, one of the other nice things about projects is that you have the ability to add contributors. I'm going to add one of my colleagues. That is not actually my colleague. I can see this. Let me go back. Okay, so this is my colleague because we already have projects in common. Um, yeah, so I can see I've used him on other projects. So I'm going to add him. Um, so now there, um, there are different permission levels. So there is an admin permission, there's a read write, and then a read. Um, admin permissions mean that, and there's more uh, information about this in our support center, um, that he can also he has the exact same privileges that I have on this project. A read write is slightly reduced privileges, and a read means he can only see this project if it were private. So I'm gonna go ahead and make him an admin. So now I've added another person to my project. I can go back to this project and it's a public project. Um, I can add a component. So I'm going to choose the same. So I can either add contributors from the initial project. So this is a, a component is basically a sub project. Um, it's a nice way to kind of structure your uh, project. So I could make this data. So let's say I'm going to have all of my data stored in one section of my project. This is an easy way to do that. Um, I can either add the contributors or I can add the tags. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add the contributors and tags to kind of enhance discoverability. I'll create this. So one of the things you'll see is there is a lock here. So this subcomponent of the project is going to be private until I decide to make it public. So this is a really nice feature. It allows you to like very specifically control what about your research you share and at what time you choose to share it. So let's say you're still in the phase of collecting data. And so this is just where you're collecting it and you're not ready to share it yet because maybe you want to analyze it first or maybe you, um, 
you want to have it all together before you choose to share. You want to finish your data collection. This allows you to choose when you can make that publicly available. Um, and you don't even, you don't have to. So this is another nice thing I can show you. So you can see that I can see that this is this component is here, but if I share, anybody else accessing this project doesn't see that component because it is completely private. The only reason I can see it is because it is my component and my project. Um, one of the other nice features about um, an OSF project is you have a wiki. Um, and this is a nice way to share information about what your project is about. So And so you can see what the view is. Um, so now I can save this. And I go back to the test project. And you can see that the wiki was, was created. I can then go back in. I can edit this. Um, and then when you go back to the wiki itself, you can see that I have the original version and then I have the edited version. So you can always go back. You can see what changes were made. Um, also on the test project, you have activity. So you can see that I updated the wiki page and then I updated again. So anytime anybody does anything with to the project, within the project, it is recorded in the activity log, which is a great way of seeing who is doing what. So let's say um, somebody, let's say one of my other contributors came in and edited the wiki and took out some information I, I think is important. I would see who did that and I would see when it happened and you could always go back to that original version, which I think is really nice. Um, one of the other great things about um, OSF projects is you can upload files. So, and there's a couple of different ways to do that. Um, so you have your data or you have your test project. Um, you can simply, like here's a, a, a sound file, you can simply drag and drop. And now I've uploaded that file. You can also um, upload a file from your desktop. I'll use the one I always use. You can do the same thing from the files page. As you can see, this file is there. You can drag and drop here. Or once again, upload a file from your computer. Oh, we'll put a picture of my dog. Okay, so you can go back to the overview. And now you can see that I have um, the files I uploaded here and you can move them around. Wait, no, I did not mean to open that. Oopsies. Okay, well, now that's going very slow. Um, one of the other things you can do is you can link an add-on. 
Um, so let's say you have files stored somewhere else that you need to connect. So you can link, I'm going to use Google Drive. Um, in order to um, enable Google Drive to work, um, you have to give it permission to link. So I'm going to confirm I want to do that. And then I need to connect an account. Um, and then I'm basically allowing, I'm telling Google that it's okay for OSF to have access to uh, my Google Drive. Yep, all of the uh, information, I do trust OSF, so I'm gonna allow. And then um, another really nice thing is um, you can see that you have not just your whole, you don't have to link your whole Google Drive, you can, but you can link a specific folder. Um, this is a test folder I always link just because I don't ever wanna link my entire Google Drive, um, but so I can just link this one section and then save. And now I go back to the test project. And I can see that I have all of this information in Google Drive that is linked to this test project. Um, and I can do the same thing. I can um, move these things around um, between Google Drive and OSF, but now that has actually been removed from my Google Drive and put here and put it back because this is a test thing that I like to use. Um, but that's the ability to move uh, objects around between different storage providers, or you can copy them and paste them. Um, so any changes you make here, um, that's why it's really good to actually have specific folders that you're linking because changes to things within your Google Drive um, are not going to be, uh, are going to actually happen in your Google Drive. So moving that as pending, I'll get an email. There's also um, on add-ons, go back. Um, we also have citation add-ons. So if you have uh, Zotero or Mendeley, you can link those. And it's the same process. You're going to um, connect your account, which is actually under my personal account. Um, So I have to, once again, give it permission in order to connect to the Zotero. And then I get to pick which library. Um, I'm gonna create my own library. So now I've ch chosen a specific library to connect to this project. Uh, and you can see you can see that the Google Drive and the Zotero is linked to this project. Okay, so now that we have uh, created our project, we've created potentially a data component. I can add another component. Um, let's say this is So once again, let's say that um, you're making your your goal of your research is to create different articles. Um, so I have a component for my data. I have a component for my articles. I'm going to go ahead and make that public. I didn't have to. Um, and I'm going to go back to the original. I'm going to take this file and I'm going to move it into the articles. Um, I'm going to have this be my research output, the content that I want to share after I finish my project. 
and I can go and let's say you want to share that you're going to submit to a journal, um, but you also want to share that as a preprint or maybe your funder has requirements that you share any of your information as a preprint. Um, you can do that using you know, an OSF project. You can also share via any of the OSF preprint providers. Um, you go to the OSF preprints. Um, here are all the providers that host uh, preprints on the OSF. Um, I'm going to pretend for the sake of this is on test that my research was actually involved in uh, Sci Archive. So maybe psychology, sociology. Um, I can. Okay. I'm just going to do an, an OSF preprint. OSF preprint, save and continue. Um, I can select that from an existing OSF project. And I can see, yep, I chose um, the test project articles. I could see this file in there. Um, it'll automatically populate with the uh, component name. Um, then there's various author assertions. Um, is there public data? Uh, yes or no, it's available or not. Um, is there a pre-registration? Yes or no, is that, um, is not, uh, there wasn't one created? Let me just say no, no. Oh, you have to choose a license. And then let's say there is a DOI, let's say you have, um, your funder has requested that you have a, any articles that are um, published also have to be shared via preprint. Um, IEEE has uh, allows that um, any of their articles that are uh, printed with them or published through them, they also allow to have open access versions. Um, other journals also potentially have open access uh, abilities. Um, some of those you have to pay for uh, the ability to share. Um, a lot of others, if it, it once again, if it's a funder requirement, um, this might be a way to meet that. And then that's always the abstract. And let's say that you're awaiting the peer review process. You can always come back and edit and add the DOI for the uh, actual uh, peer reviewed version of your article. I'm going to do it in life sciences again. I picked biochemistry just because that was what I love. Um, and then let's say that while my colleague Daniel is on the project, I'm the only one who wrote the article. I have the ability to um, remove him from the citation, but keep him on the uh, on the preprint itself, or leave him on the citation, or just remove him completely. And then there's always a conflict of, not always, but there's generally a conflict of interest statement. No, this is a test. Um, and then let's say that you had data that you want to link. Um, you can connect with an existing OSF project. You can create a new project where you want to put the data um, if you didn't already have an OSF project. Or let's say there is no supplemental materials. There is no data. There are no other figures that you want to share. Um, then you can just continue. And then I would submit this preprint. Um, and then depending on the preprint provider, there may be a moderation process where somebody has to review this. Um, there may not be. It's very dependent upon the preprint provider. I'm just going to cancel because I have a bunch of junk preprints already from doing these webinars and from other um, test, test cases. OK. Um, like I said, the OSF is here to help you throughout all of your planning um, and uh, projects. Um, we have a bunch of uh, 
test projects that we can show you that have, you know, like I said, the sub projects, um, you have Dr. Smith's research lab, you can have research initiative one, you can have the hypothesis that would potentially link to a registration. You have your data collection, any protocols, any lab notebooks, um, any research outputs. You can also link um, what I should have showed you also in um, your test project with add-ons. You can also link any code. So let's say you have a GitHub account, which I actually do. You can also link that. So now I have uh, linked also GitHub for my code, any code that is associated um, with data analysis, you can link here and can also be a supplemental, a supplemental material that you choose to share with a preprint or just for a funder requirement. Okay, moving back. Sorry to jump back like that. Um, like I said, there's a lot of different ways you can structure your project. Um, you can structure it based on research initiatives. You can have a whole bunch of different subcomponents, even under that data collection um, component. I could have had, you know, data collection from, um, you know, microscopy, data collection from running PCR, uh, data collection from um, various like questionnaires or any other type of pathology or um, other things you want to think about having your collect, like how you want to structure it so that it's very easy to find. Uh, the lab notebooks, um, you can also have people creating lab notebooks on the OSF, which is great because then it's searchable, it's digitized. Uh, I was in a lab back in the days where everybody's lab notebook was a paper book. Um, it's a lot harder to go back and find things in a paper book than it is in a digital format because the, the digital formats are uh, a lot easier to search and find things within. Um, here are some other examples of projects and components and how you can structure these. Um, I went through the preprints. One of the other really nice things about the OSF is um, we are a uh, personal identifier ready. So anything you create, your institution is linked through your uh, research organization or through their research organization registry. If your org ID is linked, anything you add will then be updated to your org ID. Um, I can show you that, but you can see that, and then the DOIs you create are just kind of all associated around that circle. So the, uh, the DOIs are associated with your ORCID, with your institutional research um, registry number or ROAR, and all of that you carry with you throughout your career, which is a really nice thing to have. Um, and then, like I said, when you, if you move institutions, or you change, uh, maybe you go emeritus, or you change, you start working in conjunction with a different institution, your email, the ability to just change your email login, change your email on your uh, OSF user account is a great way to make sure you take all of your content with you, although it will always be associated with your work as well. Um, now comes the end part. If you have, if you need any help or have any more questions, um, we have a bunch of video references. We have the OSF Support Center, um, which is a great way, like if, like I mentioned permissions. So if I just look up, understand contributor permissions. Um, so this is a nice article. We also have a lot of other articles on pre-registrations and registrations, um, or 101 uh, benefits and registrations, overview and general processes, um, creating a registration, such as what kind of templates are there. I briefly mentioned the open-ended versus a pre-registration, but we have a whole table about all of the different templates. Um, you can just see a Google Doc showing you the template and the questions in it, which is a really nice way to gain familiarity. Um, and then one of the things I forgot to mention and I can go into now is a really nice thing about registrations is that you can um, always associate with these. Um, go to registrations. 
whether or not you, so you have your, you know, this is my uh, study design plan. And then, so we have over 10,000 registrations on the OSF. Um, but then you have the ability to add data, code, materials, papers, or supplements to that registration. So I can also filter by, do these registrations have data? So you see there's 514 results with data. Um, and these are just, you know, some of those different um, different registrations that have actual data associated with them. Um, it's a really nice display too, because it's colored when it's actually there as opposed to not. So um, that is another way you can find things that you're looking for, like data associated with registrations. Um, and then if it's licensed, So now, you know, all of the data that is CC by Attribution International is, um, is which is usable, would be filtered right here. So that is a very nice feature of our search. Um, you would also be able to filter by your registration template. Okay, so going back to... Um, like I said, if you have any questions or need any help, support at osf.io. Um, any other webinars and events that we have, um, if you want to have any, if you're interested in organizational partnerships, um, you may be having, if you're, you know, in a position where you want your institution to become a member, um, please use this link. Uh, we always welcome more institutional members and we have features and webinars associated with OSF institutions that can give you more information about what um, tools there are on the OSF that a membership would allow you to utilize. Um, and I think, oh, and then as I mentioned earlier, we do, we are setting up new OSF office hours. Um, our follow-up email will have links to schedule 15-minute session, 15-minute sessions with COS staff in order to get specific help about problems or bottlenecks you are having on the OSF um, that we will be able to help you with. And if it's not uh, able to be resolved in that 15 minutes, then you'll have the ability to potentially follow up on that. Um, like I said, this is for OSF help, not necessarily open scholarship or open science practices at this time. Um, we also have a lot of training events that you can get your institution to um, sign up for. Uh, we have a whole training process on giving um, giving more information about how to you know meet best practices when it comes to open scholarship and practices within that area. Um, creating data management plans, how to create and do project or registrations and pre registrations. Uh, the importance of um, a lot of the practices that allow. Um, easy access and discoverability of the research that is going on within your institution or within your organization. Okay. Last thing, closing poll. I'm glad it seems that y'all have gotten something out of this. And like I said, um, if you have any other questions, the uh, OSF office hours will be um, will be shared in the follow up email, which will be coming out um, either end of this week or early next week. The registrations and <laughs> pre-registrations and register reports are always big on the uh, topics for more information. Um, okay. I don't know if there's any questions that I need to get to in the 
chat at a Q&A through components. Oh, no, you can also get a DOI for a component. I can, oh, God. Yeah. Um, so if I go back to this. Um, so for this one, for the articles, or like, let's say data. I'm going to go ahead and make my data public. There's not anything in it, so it doesn't really matter. But once I make the component public, I can create a DOI for just the component. Oh gosh. Yeah, you're welcome. And collect everything is getting on the folders and subfolders and folders rather than have the OSF stores. Oh, hmm. I don't think I understand Matthew's question. Uh, that's because I answered the first part of it. And I'm just oh, okay. <laughs> Zoom was being weird and it kind of popped back and forth. Okay, no worries. I'm just yeah. like, I don't think I got it. Um, no, I think we sorted it out. Okay. And then um, Amy uh, is, if you've collected pilot data, but have not collected any actual project. Um, I can answer this question. Though. Yeah, I was going to say Mark. Yeah. Um, so this is actually one of our most common questions. If you expect to register your pilot data and do some kind of report and uh, do your actual study separately, then yes, you might want to do two different registrations. Um, if you anticipate to include your pilot data within your study, you might just want to do one. The key difference here is if you expect to analyze your pilot data for another paper. If yes, two different pre-registrations. If not, and you just want to simulate them together, then no, you just have to do one registration. Okay, are there any other questions anyone wants to throw in the Q&A? We Maybe have a couple that are popping in the main chat. Oh, okay, the chat Between chart. all the <laughs> awesome thank yous. Uh, oh, yes, the recording will be sent out uh, along with the uh, sign up for the OSF office hours um, and the Google sheet that we referenced in this that had all of the links to do the same things that I demo today. Um, uh, I don't know, Eric, sorry, Mark, did you want to ask about the systematic review? Um, sure. So the question is, I am working on a systematic review and have started the paper selection. Is this data collection or can I pre-register? The real question is, is if you started actually analyzing your that data already. If you started looking into the data and started peeking through it and see what kind of analysis you need to do, technically that is a, a registration. Um, you can still go ahead and submit a registration that's no problem the key part is if you actually started doing any of that analysis piece um regardless i would still encourage that you submit a registration you, the answer is still going to be that you would likely use the generalized systematic review template to do that because that's specifically catered to systematic reviews meta-analysis and other similar types of studies um i see Saad asked if you get a doi for your article on the osf do you need one for your actual publication that is up to you. It depends upon what your funding requirements are and what you need um, for your uh, research um, in your career. Um, a DOI for a preprint provider. Uh, most preprints are not peer reviewed and that is indicated on them. Um, so it is just a means of getting your content out there. Um, if you want to have a publication that is peer reviewed, a DOI for that may be more important. Um, it really depends upon your um, what your institution or what is required in your career path. Um, I know a lot of institutions are moving towards having peer um, preprints be on par with peer-reviewed journals, but uh, it's not quite there yet. Um, let's see if there are any other questions. I can see. I think that's it. If anything else. Anyone else wants to drop a question in there? We've still got a few minutes. Otherwise, I will give you back six minutes of your time. But thank you for joining us. And like I said, you know, the office hours are new. I'm um, kind of really excited to, to launch those and, you know, have help people in person um, as opposed to just talking to you 
uh, via screen. So have a great rest of your week and thanks for joining us.